Brian Keith Mitchell is a native of New Orleans and was formerly an associate professor of history at the University of Arkansas, <coughs> excuse me, University of Arkansas Little Rock, and is an associate faculty member at the Anderson Institute on Race and Ethnicity before leaving in the spring of uh, 2022. Mitchell currently serves as the director of research and interpretation for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. A graduate of the University of New Orleans, Mitchell is the winner of the 2021 Phyllis Wheatley Award for monumental Oscar Dunn and his racial fight in Reconstruction Louisiana, 2021 Louisiana selection for the Library of Congress. Great reads from great places. Finalist for the Organization of American Historians, Civil War and Reconstruction Book Award. The National Council of English Teachers, Orbis Pictus Bronze Medal, and the American Association of State and Local Histories Excellence in History Leadership Award. He is the author of numerous papers, book chapters, and books, and it's nationally recognized for his public history and digital humanities projects, which often explore difficult and forgotten histories. His research has been covered by CNN, Atlas, Obscura, uh, the New York Post, The Guardian, National Public Radio, New York Times, Washington Post, and the Associate Press. The next voice you will hear is Dr. Brian Keith Mitchell. Thank you, uh, Ms. Coleman, for that warm welcome. It's good to be back in Little Rock, even if it's uh, virtually. Um, today I'll be uh, delivering a presentation that I call The Partitioning of the City, an Examination of Slum Clearing, Urban Renewal, and Racism in Little Rock. And there's a little story behind this. You know, how did I, I begin this story? And the story begins really twofold. Um, it begins with a project that I was working on in 2010. In 2012, I was writing the first fair housing equity assessment for Central Arkansas. And I, I was going through a lot of old maps, and I came to a little community called West Rock. And I'd never heard of West Rock. I'd been living here a few years by then. And I was very curious about where this community was. So as I began asking people about West Rock, uh, most of the people I asked uh, knew nothing of it. And I mentioned it at dinner with my father-in-law. My father-in-law said, I'm from West Rock. And he said, uh, yeah, my family lived in West Rock. West Rock was in an old black community on the western expanses of the city, right at the right near Allsop Park today. He said, um, the, the whole town of West Rock was taken from the black residents who lived there. So that, that just piqued my interest even more. And when I began teaching uh, my students about West Rock, one of the things that became very clear to me is um, how important geography is and landscapes. Quite often, students think that cities uh, develop organically in the United States, that there are no influences that determine where people live. And they underestimate the capacity that a location has to impact one's life. So I began this discussion from the standpoint of those two comments. First, uh, this report that was done in 2012 to look at fair and equitable housing. And secondly, um, how housing and location of housing and the value of housing impact us today. For most people, the home that they purchase will be the largest purchase that they will make in their lifetimes. Um, 
for many in American society, that purchase um, comes with the assurance that over time its value will increase. Um, but this isn't the same for every American. Um, some Americans don't have that assurity. And quite often, the values of property are connected directly to the race of the resident that is holding the property at that given time. So in beginning the discussion, I want to start off by showing you in this opening screen a map of the 1940s slum clearance projects. And if you look at that map, you'll see areas that are delineated in orange that are described as slum areas. All of these slum areas had concentrations of what were seen as undesirable populations. And most typically, those undesirable populations were African Americans. Um, what most of my students notice when I show this map is that African Americans seem to be all over the city. And these areas that are described as slums seem to be in every community. So, African Americans were distributed throughout the entirety of the city. If we take a look at a modern map, however, and this is called a point map, or uh, quite often in the field they call them Christmas tree maps because we often use bright colors to illustrate uh, uh, populations. Every one of those green dots that you see there is approximately 10 people. And the green are, are white families, the red are black families, and the blue are Hispanic families. And there's nothing organic or neutral about this distribution when you look at the previous map and you see there were African American communities throughout the region. What you see here is a very sharp delineation from where blacks and whites live in Arkansas. So um, today's presentation tells the story of just one of those communities. But this story uh, is replicated by each of those orange communities that we saw that were later moved to the eastern side of the city. The community that we'll be talking about today is West Rock. And the earliest mention of West Rock appears in May of 1884 as a hundred residents of a small community merged together to try to incorporate their community. The reason that they want to incorporate their community is the roads are terrible. They're dirt roads. Uh, when it rains, they're muddy and people get stuck. And they realized that in the incorporated sections of town, of, of Little Rock, the city is responsible for those roads and maintaining them and improving them. So what the people of West Rock are trying to do in 1884 is get uh, assistance in building better roads. However, as they began uh, gathering over the next two years, they're not as unified as they once were on this idea of roads because many of the many of the residents, particularly business owners, find out that they'll have to pay increased taxes if they uh, unify if they allow themselves to be annexed by the city of Little Rock. So by 1886, a vote is taken, and they decide that they're not going to uh, unify or annex the annex by the city of Little Rock. Um, however, the name West Rock sticks for the community. And from that point on, uh, the word West Rock is used to describe that Western aspect. Students ask all the time, what was there in that area before, before the city annexes it and before it becomes part of Little Rock? And probably the largest expanse of land there, um, which is now Murray Park, was a plantation called the Field Plantation. And we were lucky enough um, to get a copy of the plantation store register. So um, 
many people talk about plantation stores and what they what they did, and they provided resources to sharecroppers, generally at exorbitant prices. Um, and you, this is a ration book, and on the ration book is the name, is a, a name on each page. And on this page is a woman by the name of Paige Reed, who is a sharecropper on the field farm. And this is important because as they start developing the land around Field Farm, and as Field Farm fails, and more of that land is uh, redeveloped for housing, many of the sharecroppers switch from being sharecroppers to workers. So many become domestic workers, others begin working at the railroad or the country club. And an opportunity emerges uh, to purchase land of their own and actually own homes for the first time. And my wife's family uh, is among some of these early sharecroppers that purchase land and are able to own homes of their own in this small community. There is also a, a cornerstone institution uh, in this community, and that cornerstone institution is a church, and it's referred to here, and this is the first mention I can find of the church. It was in March 20, uh, on March 25th, 1889 in the Arkansas Democrats. The name of the church it, at that time is Pilgrim's Rest Colored Church. Um, the church's uh, full name is actually Pilgrim's Rest Missionary Baptist Church Number 3. And it is really the only surviving black institution. Dr. Mitchell. Um, Yes. Can you uh, start your PowerPoint slide? You're still on the very first slide. Okay, I'm going to have to, I'm sorry, I'm moved. Sorry about that, y'all. I wanted to, his last, he was just stuck on one slide. I know he didn't realize it. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yes. Okay. Is it still on the main screen or is it on? You have a, um, a message on the middle of your screen, though. Knocked down and forced to move, 
Um, that is the only institution that survives um, the move. And it's really important because many of the residents uh, or the descendants of those residents um, still attend Pilgrim's Rest Baptist, uh, Pilgrim's Rest Missionary Baptist Church number three. Um, it's right off of what was Confederate Road. So it is in the Granite Mountain area uh, where many of the families were relocated to after uh, the community is forced to move. Are you able to see World Fair 
and to build neighborhoods. Uh, he would call this addition the West Rock addition, and it's built right next to Blasky Heights. Um, he sees this as advantageous. Um, he wants to build an addition that is for African Americans, and he does this particularly in that neighborhood because he realizes that it will supply labor for most the, the industrial and railroad endeavors that are ongoing in the area and also supply labor for um, the domestics that would be needed in Plasky Heights. This advertisement is an advertisement for West Rock Edition. And you see in that second paragraph, West Rock Edition to Pulaski Heights, the initial 50 uh, lots being sold. This advertisement is a little bit more detailed. It tells a little bit about who his target residents are. And then you see West Rock. Uh, a new town for colored people. And if you scan down, you'll realize that West Rock's extremely affordable. Um, it maintains, their advertisement maintains that with $5 down and $2 a month, a black family could purchase a home of their own. use a series of gimmicks and we use name recognition uh, to build trust with African-American families. Um, he'll have events on Labor Day and Fourth of July and these events will include brass bands and recognizable figures uh, giving keynote speeches and one of the uh, first people that he has in September on uh, September 5th of 1910 is Scipio Africanus Jones the noted attorney. Um, and and Sibyl Alcantis Jones was really making money off of this. He did, he worked as an agent for the company, so when people bought lots, he would also make a commission off of the lots that were being sold. Now, I want you to compare this to the neighboring community. Remember what I said just a few moments ago, that uh, West Rock was developed to provide labor for Pulaski Heights. Um, it wasn't developed as an alternative uh, for Pulaski Heights. So the residents in West Rock could not go and live in Pulaski Heights. And this is one example of this different, uh, of how they describe the two communities. Uh, and in this advertisement for Pulaski Heights, you see very clearly in, in, in bold lettering that African Americans and small houses uh, that they describe as shanties would not be allowed. Uh, you also get an idea of elements of the white city that were brought to Pulaski Heights. Uh, in this advertisement, it maintains that Pulaski Heights is a place where you can have good health, pure air, pure water, beautiful shade, electric lights, sewage, water, first class electric car service, um, and this is that this was an exclusive uh, neighborhood, and it, it says exclusive white neighborhood. Uh, there is also a big difference in pricing. Uh, even though this property is right down the hill from uh, West Rock, the prices are substantially higher. So you're playing for the exclusiveness of this community um, and the, the quality that is in the houses, even much, much larger houses. In 1933, one of the city's largest businessmen and a leading developer in town will be a part of the Works Progress Administration. And as a part of the Works Progress Administration, he was invited to a conference that was there. And the conference, uh, at the conference, he learned something. And this will be very, very valuable when we start talking about the redevelopment of the city of Little Rock. What he learns is by forming organizations that are comprised of both political, nonpartisan, and interest groups, um, he can use these uh, to suggest the removal of property, getting buy-in from the community at large. 
And he makes a statement about this when he returns to the city in the newspaper, um, suggesting that uh, Little Rock start developing an organization like this. And he says that an organization of representatives, the press, the Chamber of Commerce, the city, the county, be formed in a nonpartisan basis to consider Little Rock as a whole and submit proposals to eliminate undesirable living and housing conditions. So from 1933, he actually um, first begins mentioning this idea of removing uh, people from the community. And this is often, uh, also advantageous because of his timing. Now, the very first case that will go to the Supreme Court in regard to the legitimacy and legality of a housing covenant will go to the Supreme Court in 1927. Um, it won't be until 1948 before they're ruled illegal, but I believe that uh, many of the people, particularly white businessmen and developers in the city, are extremely forward thinking and believing that we should move now to remove uh, undesirables using planning and using other strategies uh, through these organizations to allow us to build the cities and the communities that we desire. And those cities and communities are all white. The war happens and when World War II breaks out, all these issues about planning uh, disappear because a large portion of the able-bodied white population uh, left the country to fight the war. However, when veterans return, the issue of housing becomes paramount in these cities, um, largely because challenges in regard to uh, racialized covenants. Um, this leads us to the death of a key figure in the city in the city of Little Rock, and the figure that passes away is a man by the name of Fred W. Alsop, um, the man that Alsop Park is named after. Uh, Alsop was a book collector and manager of the Arkansas Gazette. Uh, he also owned a bookstore called the Chapel Bookstore. And when he passes away, he makes a will. And in that will, he gives a portion to Alsop's Park. And the, the $5,000 proceed from the sale of his rare book collection is supposed to go to the purchase of the homes of black people that are right on the border of the park and to knock down their homes and expand the park. This is a small amount of money, but it will be used as the basis of an argument that will begin in the community and a galvanization to taking the property from Alfred, uh, African Americans that are living in West Rock. Um, this movement doesn't just use uh, the synergy that we talked about of public and private entities, it will also use intimidation. And one example of intimidation were a series of fiery crosses that burned atop um, that Alsop Mountain, that little hill that's there, um, but in clear vision of all the residents. So fires, uh, these fiery crosses were lit at night, at least on two occasions, I was able to find newspaper clippings of them. And they illustrate the intimidation that's being used um, to get African Americans to leave their community. The press was also a part of this campaign. And what the press would do is go into the African American community, uh, take pictures of what was going on there, and use these pictures and in a very a strategic way. They would post these pictures of uh, shanties or, or the most neglected houses in the West Rock community. In this particular house, I asked individuals who had lived in West Rock, who did this particular house belong to? And many of the residents told me that this was the home of a widow who had uh, no children. So she had no visible means of support. And her house was among one of the, the worst maintained in the community, and they would show this alongside a house, a modern house, that they maintain could replace that house if the entire community was wrapped.
on August 1st, uh, 1946, an anonymous letter was sent to the newspaper and the letter was signed taxpayer. Uh, in the correspondence, the alleged taxpayer reported what he believed was going on in West Rock. He maintained that West Rock uh, was full of hogs that were running free, and that was the place was full of uh, a breeding ground for rats, mosquitoes, and a cesspool. Uh, and it typically called the entire LV, uh, area a filthy lot. Um, there was huge outcry uh, when this letter went out, and uh, a junket was born to go visit West Rock. And this junket was comprised of a man by the name of Mr. Scarlett, who was over public health and sanitation. The uh, all, the alderman for this uh, this section of the town, a um, number of, a number of um, members of the press, and people from the mayor's office, all made their way in this huge junket to the community of West Rock. And when they got there, they found nothing that had been described by this alleged taxpayer. In fact, what they found there, when they got there, there was a single hall and a pen that was pinned. So they began looking for other problems uh, in the community um, that were um, code violations. And the only thing that they could lock themselves into was the notion that many of the houses did not have running water and uh, did not have sanitation uh, lines connected to the homes. Instead, they used privies, but privies were not against the law. Uh, what the city maintained is that they were within 500 feet of privies and homes within 500 feet of sewage lines had to uh, lock themselves into those city sewage lines. So the people of West Rock banded together um, hired their own contractors or did the work themselves and connected themselves to these sewage, these sewage lines in order to meet, make sure that that violation was removed. However, this wasn't enough for the white residents who by that time had to beat up uh, the proposed taking of West Rock amongst a number of groups. Uh, among these groups that were in the staking or had staked their claims on portions of West Rock were the garden center, the garden group for all sides, the women's uh, floral or garden group in the rock. Um, the public school system and at Pulaski Heights needed a baseball diamond and they had not built one and they saw West Rock as the perfect place to build their, uh, to build their baseball diamond. And the, uh, the highway commission that wanted to come through and put Interstate 10 through West Rock, and all they needed was a portion of that land uh, to do it. There were also developers that wanted to create a separate business district and commercial district for the people of the highway, and and to ensure that uh, whites could have a white only shopping district. Once again, the people of West Rock galvanized themselves against uh, these measures. And one of the leaders of West Rock, a man by the name of John Aaron, uh, would send in a letter to the editor. And this is a fantastic letter um, where he talks about his history in West Rock, um, the fact that his grandmother uh, had been one of the founding pioneers of the community, and that they had come to West Rock when it was seen as an undesirable place, built up the community, and now the community was being taken away from them. Um, as the housing development began uh, pressuring the people to, from West Rock, uh, in West Rock to move, one of the offers that was made um, was to give the individuals who own these homes, um, some of them for generations, uh, amounts as small as $100 for their homes, um, making it impossible for them to relocate to other areas. Ultimately, they were able to, to move successfully um, the community at West Rock uh, by having an election. 
And this election pitted white voters in the city against black voters in the city. And with a relatively small turnout, um, whites were able to extract blacks from the West Rock community. And you can see in this article that the number of voters for the removal were 5,032, and the number of voters against the removal were 4,026. The removal of the West Rock community uh, meant that some 65 families uh, by this point, by 59, would have to be moved. And we know a little bit about those families. I mean, I, I know a great deal more now since I've been making uh, a history of, of West Rock and going house by house and uh, annotating who these families were. But um, there were some 90 families originally there by 1959, when they finally get the last families to agree to move, there are 65 that encompass that last movement out. Um, we know their occupations, and if you look at this list, you can see what the people in West Rock did for a living. Uh, this comes from the report that was done by the Housing Authority uh, and the federal government and their push to remove uh, the West Rock families. You see babysitters, petitions, caddies at the country club, cafeteria workers, contractors, uh, country club workers, custodians, domestic workers, seamstresses. Um, there are a few federal employees, uh, landlords, laborers, uh, and in the case of my wife's family, the landscapers, but her grandfather owned the landscaping company that was centered out of West Rock, which served the homes in Pulaski Heights. This last, this chart that I'm showing now is, um, shows the families that were moved where they were moving, the living conditions they were in, and the salaries, the financial cost of moving them. And you've got to remember what I, what I, I told you, they were offering them $100 in some cases for their homes. So the idea of would you be moving into another home that you purchased, would you be moving into a rental property? And many of these people who are homeowners are moved into rental property and uh, many of them won't own homes again in their lifetimes and probably many of them uh, of their descendants didn't own homes either after the families were moved the houses were optioned to developers um, and this is uh, an article in the newspaper showing the options and sales of these properties. Remember what we talked about a few minutes ago with privies and sewer lines. All of the sewer lines that they had effectively put in at their own cost, all of that was dug up and destroyed. And the city built a new modernized sewer system for the residents that were coming to replace West Rock. We got to talk about how the taking of West Rock was rebranded. And it was rebranded in the city as a renaissance and as uh, the way that planning should happen. It becomes a model, a model for Southern planners. And in fact, planners come by the busload to visit the West Rock community to see how they can uh, do similar extractions in their own and their own cities and towns while the entire budget that was allocated for the repayment of uh, the residents of restaurant were just uh, in the in the very low thousands you can see that the the cost of development of the area to make it an all-white area was quite substantial in fact for 54 acres, 
um, there was some five million, uh, five hundred thousand put into investment. There was less than three hundred, less than four hundred thousand um, was put to acquire the homes and to relocate the family. So very little money was put aside um, to help the the residents of West Rock relocate. We have to ask ourselves, what was the overall effect of this moving and why is it important when we start talking about uh, wealth and business in the city? One of the things that the moving of all of those, those yellow communities that were slum clearance communities, the moving of them eastward did was to consolidate poverty into one area. So for the first time, um, Little Rock is uh, being described nationally as full of ghettos. And these ghettos, as the ACLU and the Urban League will discover, are amongst the poorest ghettos in America. And I want to take us back to the map that we saw in the beginning. Um, this map shows uh, the modern distribution. It's done with something called a dissimilarity index. And the dissimilarity index describes the amount of white people that would have to move to create um, uh, an even distributed community. And we're in the top 5% of, of the nation in regards to dissimilarity. Uh, a tremendous amount of the white population would have to move eastward in order for there to be an equal distribution of blacks and whites across the country. When we talk about this entrenched poverty, we must also talk about what we call um, racially concentrated areas of poverty. And raci racially concentrated areas of poverty is the term that is used um, today to describe areas of entrenched racialized poverty. Um, it will replace the word ghetto um, in federal documents. And in 2012, when I did the study of Central Arkansas, we discovered that there were five such areas um, in Little Rock. And these are the census tracts, so 30.02, 30.01. Both of those areas had been predominantly white areas um, where the white residents uh, fled during and after the Brown decision and particularly after 1970, the 1974 decisions to start busing. Um, Track 28 had always been African-American. That's the, the dark hollow area. And it was comprised largely of African-American railroad workers. Um, track 46 is a rapidly gentrifying area downtown. So this is Soma uh, would be in this area. And track 12 is by far the poorest area in, um, in central Arkansas. And that is the area along Asher where you have the jail, you have uh, many drug rehab centers that are located and halfway houses are located in that area. We look at the poverty index and what this movement has meant for our Kansans. If you look at the white areas, the areas that are indicated in white on the map, those are concentrations of the poorest areas in the region. So all of the poorest areas in Arkansas, in central Arkansas, are located uh, right where uh, African Americans were moved to. If we look at foreclosure risks, you have to remember in 2012 when I began making a lot of these maps, uh, we were going through the Great Recession. And when we start talking about you know where, who was at risk of losing their homes, you look below 630 um, and you see that all of the highest areas of risk uh, for property foreclosures are all in these heavily concentrated areas in the west, uh, in the east. When we look at maps for food deserts, 
where in a food desert, in the case of an urban area, is an area that a person would have to travel more than one mile to get fresh foods. Um, these are also in the areas of the east and those below 630. Look at violent crime, and as Marcus really said, uh, crime as you know, poverty is the mother of crime. If you look at uh, this crime map, violent crime map, the areas of the highest concentrations of violent crime were also located in 2012 in these areas that uh, the poor were moved into. If we look at food camp, uh, SNAP program participation, so family households that were receiving food stamps, same community. If we look at incarceration, and incarceration is uh, really something that I, I enjoyed looking at because the maps really showed uh, some incredible things. Uh, if you looked at arrests, you see arrests throughout the district. So you, throughout Central Arkansas, there are arrests for crime. But when we looked at who was going to prison for crimes, um, that dark maroon area is who's actually being incarcerated and the cost for incarceration in those areas. The most expensive uh, incarceration cost for the region was that fourth track, that census track 12, and I'll, I'll give us a zoom in the census track 12. And it, it's sparsely populated. In fact, many of the houses are boarded up there, but the cost um, that are associated to it with incarceration per capita were among the highest in in the entire um, in the entire area. So, in, with, throughout the metropolitan region, this little census tract with virtually no people, we were spending the bulk of federal dollars for that census tract. We're going to do incarceration and failing public schools. Um, there, for those of you who are interested in looking at sort of the demographics of this region and this uh, report, it's called the Fair uh, uh, Housing and Equity, um, it's FHEA, Fair Housing and Equity Assessment. And you can look at this, look at this report in its entirety by going to Metro Plan site and pulling it up. You can just go to their search bar and put in FHEA. And there's only two of them that have ever been done for Central Arkansas. The first was done in 1968, and I did the second in uh, 2012. Okay, that ends my discussion. If there are any questions, I am sorry for the, the technical difficulties this morning. Does anyone have any questions? Raise your hand. Uh. He, can you what he's going to give you a mic so you can speak into it of eminent domain to be predatory in African-American communities. 
Um, and planning itself predatory in this community. You have to remember that planners after the Euclid, Euclid versus Amboy case, were probably some of the most hated people in America. Um, most people didn't like planners until the 1920s and 30s came along, and there were these threats against racialized covenants. And it's during that period of time that you have people like Harlan Bartholomew and Robert Moses emerge as sort of heroes for the white community because they're able to retain, they're able to show people how to retain these white, uh, all white communities. Uh, another thing that uh, begins to emerge are uh, these sort of regional, regionalized groups like Metroplan. Those, Metroplan was born in the 50s during the whole 54 struggle. And for the same reasons that CAMAC wanted uh, an organization like that developed, um, it put all of the synergy, all of the professionals on the side of the government who is, who is actually actively trying to keep segregation alive. So, um, planning has a really sort of checkered history as a field in the United States or as a profession in the United States. The first professional uh, planner in the United States was a man by the name of Harlan Bartholomew. And Harlan Bartholomew specialized in creating racially resistant communities. And he would redevelop in his lifetime, in his firm, over 500, they wrote 500 plus comprehensive plans for cities, all meant to make uh, these cities less resistant to having blacks uh, move into white communities. Many uh, devices that we see and many features in neighborhoods that we see as sort of quaint now really were strategic in their development. Things like cul-de-sacs were created because it made it very, very difficult for people to walk around uh, these communities and blacks were less likely to have cars and more to be more dependent on on a public transportation. So it, even simple devices that we see every day, we don't really know the origin of them. Uh, quite often, we uh, also see communities, like I lived in uh, Park Hill, and one of the things that was really annoying to me about Park Hill is it didn't have sidewalks. And you have to ask yourself, why, why was this community developed uh, for families without sidewalks? And it was never meant to be a walking community where people were walking around. They didn't, you know, mm. the blacks needed to walk to get to uh, bus lines. They needed to walk to get to stores. Um, they made it as difficult as possible in these communities to have um, particularly working class blacks moving into those communities. Any more questions? Oh. Dr. Mitchell, you mentioned about the regentrification is taking place now, uh, Main Street coming east, East Village. Could you talk a little more about that? How is that going to affect blacks down in that area? One of the things that happened after 54, one of the direct effects that 54 had was once, and, and even more so, the failure of what was called the Southern Manifesto, um, this commitment that was signed by um, a great number of Southern politicians to resist the Brown vision and integration as much as they possibly could. Once that failed, um, whites saw uh, no, uh, no reason to stay in the cities. They wanted these exclusively white schools and communities. So many of them moved out to bedroom uh, communities, uh, these communities that were on the peripheries of cities. So they could still go to work, and um, but they have an independent school district that they would control. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why organizations like Metro Plan and other planning authorities were created, because they could funnel money into the development of these highway systems that could get the people who are moving out to these far flung places back and forth to work every day. So the development of 630 wasn't about transportation for people who lived in the city. 
It was about transportation for people who were these new suburbanites that had lived on the periphery. Now, fast forward that um, from 1960 to the 1990s, these, um, as, and, and it's sort of a self fulfilling um, curse. If you move out to a suburb, you want the amenities that you had in the state. So you start building things like uh, Targets, Walmarts, you start building fast food restaurants, movie theaters, but you need a workforce that is gonna work there. So all the people that you're running from, you need their labor, so they start coming over. And eventually some developer said, it's a great idea, I can build an apartment building here. And before you know it, that suburb now has black people in it. So then you have to build another for the suburb that's further west. So what we saw um, from the 60s to the 90s were these ever-expanding concentric circles around the city where people move further and further and further and further out. But the cost became so expensive, the fuel costs and the amount of time for these excursions back to the workplaces in the city that people began to eye redevelopment, particularly, particularly the children of that first generation that had moved out because what they discovered is to live in an all white community, you have to pay a premium. So they targeted inner city communities that placed them very, very close to work where they could buy property and they can redevelop that property. So that's what we saw in the rare house district along the river. When along the river, you saw the development there, and then it began to work very slowly, work its way down Main Street. And now that that area is almost completely redeveloped and largely uh, white, they they want to expand that that growth to other communities, and then. What happens to the black and the poor community then is that the community is displaced and that it's called displacement. And the question we have to ask ourselves is where is this displacement taking place in our region uh, or your region? It used to be my region. But what, um, where would they go and what services are available for them there? Why, when we talk about uh, blacks deciding, uh, particularly for African Americans and for Hispanics, or whites for that matter, deciding where they're going to move, there are generally uh, two key factors that they think about. And one is access to transportation, the other is access to work opportunities, and, um, and the cost of housing but overrides, supersedes both of those. So as they're being priced out of markets and the only place that's going to be affordable in the region, at least according to the projections that I did, were the Southwest. And it's, it was really, really funny to me when I started examining the movement to the Southwest because the Southwest is dirt of many things. So it doesn't have a lot of uh, fresh food options, it doesn't have a lot of job options. The only thing it really has is transportation and, and cheap housing. But that puts a lot of pressure on the, the suburbs that are adjacent to it. So when you look at Benton and you look at, what's the other, what's right next to Bryant. Bryant. One of the things that they grew up very quickly as they started um, Look at these projections where moratoriums on apartment buildings. So, you know, you know, and then when they realized that you couldn't have a permanent moratorium on apartments, what followed that was instead um, a ratio that was created. So you need to build so much um, fixed family units before you could build another apartment building. And they made, made sure that um, the requirements for building another apartment building would ensure that the residents in that apartment building would be uh, wealthy. So you have to have like a golf course. They had a whole list of a menu of things. You have to have uh, a golf course, a pool. You have to have uh, two or three parking, uh, two, was it 
two park of uh, a parking slot per bedroom. <laughs> so for uh, every apartment that's three bedrooms, they would have to have three three parking spaces. It had to have a, a number of features that would only elevate the price of rent. Mm. So that's you know, you know uh, they can't openly say that that's what it. But those features are generally used to exclude people from communities. Any more questions? I have uh, two. So uh, thank you for this presentation, Dr. Mitchell. I can see a parallel with Raisin in the Sun, and I really went back to that uh, feature. So with the Metro Plan, since it's been 10 years since you did your research, uh, are they as strong today, 10 years later, as they were then? And then, uh, since you did mention Lord Lua, the Bering Cross area where they come out to the river and started putting up those units that they took over the Bering Cross area there by the river. Yes, um, Argenta has tried to follow the model. The model works so well on the other side of the river um, with creating a tax base there. And the problem is they really, really could have done a much, much better job with that if they would have had mixed income housing that was dispersed throughout um, the riverfront and throughout um, throughout the Soma region. The problem that they run into is everybody wants, all these developers really, really want to make high profits. So they target um, the high end of the marketplace instead of uh, building a place of affordable housing for the region. The Central Arkansas is, in, is gonna have serious problems with housing in regard to affordable housing. We, you guys were, and I keep saying we because I keep thinking of myself as a, a resident there. I do own property there. Um, there, there isn't enough affordable housing right now, and no affordable housing is being built on the scale that it needs to be built on. So that far forces people into a sub market of private owners who don't necessarily. Uh, maintain their property and the government, the federal government doesn't want to be a part of the supply and housing factor anymore. It, it would rather um, pass this on to public and uh, uh, private entities through Section 108. Yeah. Um, they probably are going to expand Section 108 vouchers in the Southwest to meet the housing needs of the poor and uh, you know, much of that housing right now is uh, substandard when we start talking about the you know, mm -hmm. highest concentrations of abandoned properties and we start talking about you know, broken window theories and crime and things like that. We're just asking for trouble. We're not planning ahead. Um, and these are things that, you know, we warned about inside of the FHEA or that um, many of these considerations needed to be made. and. Now we're, we're 10 years out from that, and we're really suffering the consequences as a region uh, for not allocating resources um, to any of these concerns. So homelessness, uh, you know, I, I lived there for 15 years. Every, I couldn't drive anywhere without seeing homeless people, and I think that the situation is only going to get worse. Well, thank you, Dr. Mitchell, for your presentation. We appreciate you.